Good morning, everybody. I hope you can all hear me. I see. Yeah. So, and uh, welcome to everyone from uh, joining us from Colombo, Singapore, Hanoi, and other parts of the region. I'm really very happy to kick off uh, this discussion in a, in a very timely way. Uh, beginning what is not an on one off conversation, but a series of dialogues that offer a platform for policymakers to share learnings as well as we all learn and adjust to the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic and our own belief that Asian countries have relatable experiences and learnings that are closer to home. Now, COVID-19 is unique, global challenge, but its effect and manifestations are not uniform. Hence, this series places a greater focus on the recovery stories from the region and aims to convene open conversations that also relate these insights back to the Sri Lankan context, as well as sharing the Sri Lankan experience with the region, which we believe also, I think we will be very happy and very proud to share. Kicking off this conversation are two stories from Vietnam and from Singapore. For us in Sri Lanka, Vietnam is a country with a large population and a similar per capita GDP. It offers for us a fascinating example of a response that curtailed the spread of less than 350 cases and zero death. It's, uh, it's really magic what, uh, what has been done there. Singapore, with a highly sophisticated approach of constant evidence generation on emerging vulnerabilities, can help also plot strategies, uh, uh, strategic pathways, as Sri Lanka uh, dynamically calibrates its own response. And with this, we really uh, thank very much Dr. Sarah Bales and Dr. Ruben Eng and Dr. Patrick Daly for uh, coming together to present the key learnings from perspectives of uh, pandemic response, as well as the socioeconomic recovery from COVID-19. Many thanks also to Dr. Caroline Prasar and colleagues from the uh, Lee Kuan Yew uh, School at the National University of Singapore for their support. And I'm extremely happy to know the diverse high-level participants from, our, uh, from the Sri Lankan government, private sector, and the civil society, and uh, our four very distinguished uh, discussions, uh, starting by Admiral Jayatna Kolombal and uh, Professor Saroj Jayasingam, uh, Dr. Dinusha uh, Pandi uh, Taratna, and Mr. Dilan Fernando, who have kindly taken time from their very busy schedule, and I know how busy they are, to help situate the learnings from 
Singapore and Vietnam to the Sri Lankan context as well. Uh, just a note on housekeeping. We will aim to keep as much time as possible for the questions and uh, discussions. And uh, for us to, to aid us with this process, we ask you to direct questions by the chat box, uh, which we will collate and uh, direct to the panelists. So to those watching on Facebook, please direct your questions in the comments section. Now to begin, uh, joining us from Hanoi, Vietnam, let me introduce our first speaker, Dr. Sarah Bales, visiting lecturer at the Hanoi University of Public Health. She comes with an extensive experience in the area of uh, policy research and quantitative uh, analysis in Vietnam, where she has worked since 1992. She holds also a PhD in public policy at the MUS Lee um, Kwan Yu uh, uh, School of Public uh, Policy. Now, her current work focuses on uh, evidence informed policy making, including technical support to government agencies on health financing and greater use of uh, um, administrative data for policy making and health system monitoring. This morning, she will discuss what measures Vietnam implemented, the contextual factors that supported the effectiveness of their approach and the prospects for uh, moving forward. Uh, so over to you, Dr. Sara, and uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for the introduction and thank you for inviting me to participate. It's a, a pleasure to be with you. Um, I'm going to uh, present with my slides, so I will, you probably won't see my face, but I'm going to uh, present the slides and try to tell you the story um, as concisely as possible about what Vietnam did uh, to achieve its success. Okay, so let me start with uh, the current situation. As of today, uh, Vietnam has confirmed 332 cases um, since the first case occurred in, in early or in the 23rd of January, and most of them have recovered, and so far there are no deaths. So I think it's something that's quite astounding. I think even Vietnam was surprised about how successful it was. Uh, so I'm going to try to explain a little bit about how Vietnam achieved this. So you can see from this figure, um, this is the trend from the first case, January 23rd until the present. Uh, Vietnam divides the cases into those cases that came in on flights, the cases that were transmitted from those um, imported cases to people in the community. Um, there are cases that uh, were spread in the community without understanding the, what the index case was, the Cobos community transmission and then quarantines upon arrival. So you can see in the early stage, Vietnam had very few cases. Uh, there were a few cases coming in from Wuhan. And once they saw that there was a cluster, they immediately locked down an entire community. And that helped to stop the spread. Uh, it was quite an extensive, I mean, it's a community of about 5,000, 6,000 people, but they just locked it down with enforcement by the police. And so nobody, could come in or out, and they, they halted the epidemic at 16 cases by, um, by a couple weeks in. And then they went for about three weeks with no new cases. And then on March 6th, the new case came in. And so you can see that they were already starting to see a new case, mostly from the incoming flights, but already spreading into the community. And immediately the government took action. So they, by the um, 18th of March, they had stopped all um, flights for foreigners to come in and they uh, had quarantined all people flying in. So not just people who came positive or who, who had high temperature, but all people uh, were quarantined from all incoming flights. But they saw that that was not enough. They could see from the evidence that there was actually continued spread in the community of cases where they couldn't figure out what the index case was. Who was that first case? So up to about 20th of um, March, 
they had always been able to tra track through the contact tracing to figure out who, who brought the, the disease into the country and then how they spread it to people in their community or in their family. But starting in around the 20th of March, they had two nurses traveling in the country, no contact with any COVID cases, but they came out positive. And that was the start of um, where the government started to take really strong action because they saw the number of cases in the community was spreading rapidly. So within that hospital, they had a very large spread of cases and there were several communities and a bar in Ho Chi Minh City where there were a number of clusters. So these were very puzzling because they didn't know what the origin was from these cases, but they were afraid. So they immediately put in place national social distancing. But the people supported this because they could also see, they were informed that there were these community transmitted cases. So the national social distancing was put in place on 1st of April. And you can see very quickly that the spread slowed down. You can see there were still a few community spread cases, but it flatlined. And so there were no more cases coming in uh, who were not quarantined. So you can see that was flat. You can see no more transmission um, of, from inbound patients to the community because they were quarantined immediately upon arrival. And you could see that they had managed somehow to stop those clusters through the contact tracing. So by April 23rd, three weeks after in, um, initiating national social distancing, they were able to lift internal restrictions, not completely, to soften them. And then by about mid-May, they were able to pretty much lift all the restrictions. Children went back to school, uh, people are out without masks, people are going to the grocery store, cafes are open, and even now karaoke bars and pubs are open. So it was a very quick response and very effective. So what I want to talk to you about is, um, let me go back. This is the strategy. So doing testing, doing contact tracing, doing quarantine, social distancing, um, limiting incoming international flights. These are measures that I think Sri Lanka has also taken. These are measures that other countries have taken. So the question is then, why did Vietnam succeed using this same strategy? What, what are the underlying uh, reasons? So I'm going to tell you a little bit about Vietnam's context before I get into more of the details of their response. So Vietnam has a substantial recent history with outbreaks. So Vietnam was badly affected by the SARS epidemic in 2003, and then avian influenza and swine influenza, and now coronavirus or COVID-19. So Vietnam has a history, very recent, it's in people's immediate memory. And as soon as they hear that there's an epidemic, the masks come out, people start wearing masks, they avoid contacts. So it's something that's part of the population's own response, regardless of the government response. The government, of course, informs people. And once they know that there's a risk, people then start taking their own actions. Um, there was also a lot of investment from CDC and WHO on pandemic preparedness. So they had a lot of training in contact tracing, in laboratory preparedness, and, and what kinds of logistics you need to have ready for a pandemic. So Vietnam was also prepared technically uh, because of this support from the technical agencies. Vietnam also has a quite strong biotechnology capacity. Um, it has high level laboratories for infectious disease. It has uh, its own vaccine production for all of the EPI vaccines. Um, so that was already very strong. Vietnam also has a strong grassroots network of health services, health workers, and of the, the way the government administration works. It, it really goes down all the way to the smallest level community, hamlets and villages. So this grassroots organization is easily and quickly mobilized when there is a national emergency. Often we think of Vietnam as a centrally run economy. It's an authoritarian regime. And that is also true. So the central authority does have quite a lot of power to enforce uh, among the provinces, the 63 provinces. So in a national emergency, they were able to really be strict about any kind of corruption that was found, any violations of quarantine, the central level authorities were able to impose penalties and to remove people from uh, office if they violated any of these uh, measures. But I think perhaps at the important political level, it's not a democracy. 
it's not a country that has to vie um, with an opposition to try to say that our way is better than your way. It's a, a communist party regime, one party regime. And there was in a sense a, a existential threat of the coronavirus um, to the communist party. If they did not succeed in containing it, then the people may rise up and be unhappy with the regime. And that was something that they were very afraid of. And as a result, they took very strong action very, very quickly. So one of the first things that, um, that they did was testing. So because they were able to quickly culture and isolate the new coronavirus in Vietnam, they were able to then start developing test kits. So they had their own test kits uh, already from March. Now they have three PCR test kits and they have one antibody test kit that they're now exporting because it's been certified by World Health Organization. So having their own test kits meant they didn't have to worry about stockouts. They didn't have to worry about international supply when there's a pandemic and the cost is lower. So they had plenty of tests to be able to test everybody that they felt needed to be tested. They're also already developing their own coronavirus vaccine. So they're in the early stages with testing on animals to develop uh, the antigens and they've had some initial successes. But I think having the biotechnology in house and being able to produce their own tests helped them to be able to move very quickly to meet all the testing needs. The second um, measure that was taken was quarantine. So Vietnam has had extensive quarantine. You can see from this figure, there were days when there were over 80,000 people in quarantine. So the policy was, if you look on the right side of the slide, any F0 is a person who's infected with COVID. And any F1 is a person who had direct contact with those people. They were all isolated in a hospital setting. They were given tests and they have to have four negative tests before they can be released back to the community. The F2 is people who had direct contact with F1 and F3 had direct contact with F2. Those cases were put into mandatory quarantine, not at home usually, usually in a central, um, central location, like army barracks, school, dormitories, and so on. And the F4s and F5s who had contact with higher levels, they were told to isolate at home and to monitor the situation of the people who they'd had contact with. But you can see that it was not a voluntary quarantine. It was really an enforced quarantine. Uh, even rich people who said, can we quarantine in a hotel or at our home? They were told, no, you must quarantine within the government's um, system. So the, the quarantine uh, was really effective. It was very extensive. Anybody testing positive was isolated, not in quarantine, but isolated in hospital and, and direct contacts and extensive direct contacts were put into quarantine. In some cases, the entire community was quarantined. And in one case, a national hospital was quarantined because there were outbreaks from the community within that hospital. It was a national hospital had to be uh, closed down for a period of time. So they could do massive testing of the community around and all of the staff and all the patients who had been in the hospital. The third thing I think that was really important was that the government communicated on a daily basis multiple times per day. Every phone call you made, they were reminding you wear a mask and, and now <laughs> reminding you help boost the economy. But the communication campaign was extremely transparent. So from the first case, uh, where they came from, where they were staying, where they may have exposed other people to the disease, that helped the people know whether they could potentially be at risk and needed to be tested. So that communication was really important. You can see from these pictures, there are some that are more public service announcements and an important video on washing hands, wearing masks. But you can also see how they were announcing which flights had patients who had coronavirus. If you were on that flight, you should go get tested. Or if you were in any of these locations with some of those people who had coronavirus at those times, you may have been exposed and should get tested. So the communication was very powerful. And it helped to, because they were so transparent, the people went along with all of the measures taken, all the restrictions, because they could see for themselves that it was risky. risky. The national social distancing was also put in place. Once the community spread happened, they knew that the only way to stop it was that they had to get people to, to slow down their contacts with other people. So they put in place a social distancing, but it was not a lockdown. It was not so strict. You could go out and buy your groceries. 
um, as long as you wore a mask and washed your hands as you entered to have your temperature taken. People could buy takeaway food. Um, they could order things online and they would be shipped to their home. Um, they could go to work as long as there were certain social distancing measures. So the social distancing was in place, but it was not so draconian. It was not a lockdown. People could still continue with many of their regular activities. And as schools opened, they also had social distancing within the schools with masks and, and keeping a desk between the students. They also took measures to alleviate hardship because they knew that for some people with certain occupations, they probably didn't have savings and they would face some difficulties. So they had uh, innovation in Vietnam, the rice ATM, where you could go, social distance in line, and then you could go up and wash your hands and then push a button and it would distribute several kilograms of rice for you to cook. Uh, they also reduced the price of electricity and gasoline. They also set up hand washing stations in the downtown area for people who were occupations where, or they were um, in the downtown area and they had no place to wash, um, wash up so that they could implement the, the safety measures needed. But this, um, they also are continuing with those measures. I think that's important to say that they're still continuing with some loans for people in small and medium enterprises and, and other measures to, to try to help with the recovery of small and medium enterprises. So the last uh, slide I want to just say, as Vietnam is re reviving its economy, it's being very careful. It has taken a stance that the human health of the population is, is the most important priority. And so as they move forward with recovery, that's always kept in mind, will that measure ensure that no new infections occur or that no deaths occur? So the emphasis is really on the safety of the population. So they're strongly promoting domestic tourism and they're still far from thinking about opening tourism to international tourists. Um, they're strongly promoting e-commerce and electronic transactions because that reduces any kind of exposure. And they're also taking advantage in some ways of the global pandemic because the market for masks and test kits is quite strong and they're able to then export goods that they can produce um, and they don't need because they've controlled the epidemic. So I think um, Vietnam has had certain measures, although it's similar measures as other countries, but the, the details of how they implemented the um, extensiveness of the quarantine and of the testing, the, the social distancing done in a way that did not lead to people being uncomfortable, but also such a short time for just three to four weeks that they were under social distancing. Um, the communication campaign, all of these things together helped create a synergy that allowed Vietnam to quickly uh, overcome the, the coronavirus and the epidemic and, and to contain all the new cases are just incoming flights. There are no cases in the community and there have been no deaths because they had enough space in the hospitals because they had not, they were not overwhelmed. There were no surges. So they had enough space to be able to take care of all the patients um, to the fullest extent that, that the medical services could. And uh, they have been very successful. So I'm going to stop there. Um, and I welcome any questions that you may have. And uh, thank you for your interest in Vietnam's response. You want me to collect it? This is excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Doctor. I think. Uh, uh, so much uh, to, to learn from, uh, impressive innovations that I think, uh, and, and lots of lessons learned. Um, so um, uh, with this, uh, maybe we now have two discussions who will help us connect with the uh, Vietnamese experience uh, to the Sri Lankan case. Uh, after the discussions, we will have time for a few uh, questions for Dr. Bales but we will focus on the clarifications on the Vietnamese case and take up general questions after our colleagues from uh, Singapore speak. Um, so comment one, allow me to introduce Dr. Dinusa um, Pandita Ratna, who is an honorary non-resident fellow at the Lakshmi, Lakshman um, Kadir Gamar Institute in Colombo, where she had previously served as the executive director as well. Um, she was an assistant professor at the Faculty of Law at the Chinese University of Hong Kong and a visiting fellow at the University of Hong Kong. With this, uh, wonderful to, uh, to meet you, Dr. Dinusha, and over to you. We also, sorry, before I go there, we also have Dr. Anil 
Jacinga, and uh, who is a man that really that needs no introductions uh, in uh, at this time in Sri Lanka. Dr. Uh, Dr. Anil, the Director General of the Health Services of Sri Lanka, and has been the forefront uh, of the national health response. So first, let's start by Dr. Dinusha first, and then followed by Dr. Dan uh, Anil. Thank you so much, Hannah, and this is uh, really an honor to be here among such esteemed company. Uh, as you said, this uh, is a great opportunity for Asian countries to learn from each other, from the countries that are, that are closest uh, to us geographically. Um, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to comment on Professor Bales' really excellent and insightful presentation. I learned so much from it. I'm speaking here as a, a non-expert, as a lay person in terms of public health and on Vietnam. Um, so uh, forgive me if um, some of my comments and questions are uh, from that perspective. Uh, I think uh, one of the things that's, that struck me from Professor Bales's uh, very, very clear presentation was the decisiveness of the Vietnamese government in handling uh, the pandemic. And I, I would say that that's uh, certainly a similarity between Sri Lanka and, uh, and Vietnam, uh, that uh, Sri Lanka has also been sort of commended for its decisive approach in, uh, in handling the pandemic. Um, uh, that said, uh, Professor Bales also uh, set out a number of uh, details on how the Vietnamese government approached uh, the pandemic. And, and those are certainly uh, great uh, learning possibilities for us uh, in the future. Um, I think w w one of the sort of general things that may be different from Vietnam and Sri Lanka is that Vietnam did have the previous experience of SARS back in 2003 uh, and would have perhaps been able therefore to build on its learning experience. Uh, so the question for Sri Lanka now is, you know, as we move out of the very strict curfew and lockdown phase, um, I, I, I would suggest that instead of sort of just trying to get things back to normal is to really think about, okay, let's convene as many experts as possible and think about what we can learn from this, our real first pandemic, just as uh, Vietnam learned from its previous uh, experience of, of a pandemic. Uh, and, there's, and there's so much that will probably flow from that, including the proactiveness of citizens, which Professor Bales alluded to in terms of, you know, they started wearing masks almost immediately. They knew what the risk was, they faced it before. You know, so how, how can um, Sri Lanka sort of encourage that kind of proactiveness amongst its own citizens uh, in future? Um, I, I thought the political economy implications of Professor Bales's uh, analysis were very interesting. She did talk about the fact that Vietnam was uh, an authoritarian um, sort of one-party state. Um, so that's different to how other um, successful jurisdictions like so South Korea and New Zealand in the Asia Pacific um, operate and their models are, are different. Um, so I, I guess one question I had was, is it the political economy model that ensures or helps uh, a better approach to pandemics, or is it certain um, certain aspects or details of the government, regardless of the political economy model, that help its responsiveness to pandemics? Uh, Professor Bales did uh, uh, mention the uh, the fact that the government was very tough on corruption. Um, others have, have sort of have mentioned uh, the fact that the government is very transparent with information, um, that the quarantine procedures were the same for rich or for poor, you know, everyone was treated exactly the same. Um, so I, I guess and that's also some, uh, something to think about when we think about the political economy implications of dealing with uh, pandemics. Um, what what uh, Professor Bales talked about in terms of what this means for Vietnam economically is also really important to think about. Uh, Vietnam uh, is renowned for its uh, it's a strong um, FDI and it's, uh, it, it's sort of a very strong economic position. Um, so it, it really stands to really double its so-called COVID dividend uh, 
in combination with this very successful handling of, of the pandemic. Um, and, you know, as we in Sri Lanka move out of the pandemic and try to also reap the benefits of our COVID dividend, given our also good, very, uh, are also good numbers on this, you know, what should we be learning from Vietnam in terms of its, its economic model, um, the fact that it uh, has, for example, an amazing network of uh, free trade agreements, um, uh, a really good ease of doing business index, all of those can help to compound and increase the COVID dividend. Um, my final uh, uh, question, I guess, was um, more on the gender dimensions of, of the pandemic. We've, we've heard a lot about uh, the, uh, the possible more adverse impact uh, on gender in terms of, um, uh, of violence, domestic violence, for example, just being one example. Um, I would be interested to hear how uh, Vietnam and uh, Singapore uh, handle those dimensions during a pandemic also as learning experiences for Sri Lanka. I apologize in advance that I have to, I have to switch off in 10 minutes, but I just raised that uh, as a question for, for the speakers. But thank you so much again. Uh, my apologies, sorry. That's uh, when you lose control of your own technology. Uh, but maybe Dr. Sils, uh, I think very pertinent comments from uh, Dr. Dinusha, and since she has to leave us so quickly, uh, uh, maybe Dr. Bales can get uh, back on her questions. And then we move to Dr. Anil. Is it okay, Dr. Sarah? Yes. Thank you very much for your comments, and I'm glad that it was useful for you. Um, so I'm just, I, there were two main questions, I think. First is, was it the political economy or was it the details of how Vietnam implemented the policy? And I think that um, it's a bit hard to untangle those two, um, but I think that by trying to look at what specific measures were taken as sort of the mechanism for action within that context, it's possible to transfer those lessons to other contexts with the democracy uh, or, or other kinds of regimes. I think um, people often link Vietnam with China, but China's approach on, on transparency of information was completely opposite. And so I think mm -hmm. it's less about the authoritarian regime, one party state. I think it's more about what they actually did. Um, and that, that's why I tried to lay out some of those details about the specific response. Um, and then your other main comment was about the gender dimensions. So I think one of the um, things that I've been reading about is that the, the NGO community, the, the community-based organizations, they uh, had difficulty reaching their clients during the, the period of time when there was social distancing. So they, they were not able to serve their clients as much as they would have liked. But at the same time, um, the social distancing in Vietnam was not a lockdown. It was not a curfew. So people were still able to get out. So if a woman was in a bad situation, she could still get out uh, of the house. She could get to the police. She could. Um, so, so I think that in a way, because it was not such a tight curfew lockdown type situation, there was a lot more um, ability for, for women who were in bad situations to be able to, to get out. But there was definitely an um, uh, adverse effect on the ability of CBOs and CSOs to perform their they're very helpful um, social welfare functions. Um, so I'm going okay. To there. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And, uh, sorry, Dr. Dimitri, that you have to leave us, but uh, but thanks for your intervention. I think and, and comments very relevant. Thank you, Dr. Anil. Over to you. Yeah. Uh, uh, good morning. Uh, thank good morning. you, Sarah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, thank you, uh, Anna Singer and uh, Dr. Sarah. Uh, Sarah for the presentation. Uh, if you uh, 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 you know uh, try to uh, uh, see parallels uh, between Sri Lanka and uh, Vietnam. Uh, now, actually, we uh, have uh, basically uh, done more or less uh, similar uh, you know uh, actions. 
Uh, when you compare with the uh, 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 Vietnam, uh, now if you go by the numbers now, as at today, uh, Sri Lanka got uh, 1,859, uh, you know, uh, cases. Uh, so, but when you, uh, uh, you know, further analyze, uh, now out of this 1,859, uh, 903 were from Navy cluster, uh, which was actually unfortunate. You could see when, uh, you know, uh, uh, this is like, you know, when uh, this uh, COVID starts spreading, uh, you know, how, how it can be bad. So the Navy cluster, 903. And then also we have another factor. I think, I believe uh, even in uh, Vietnam, there must be a considerable uh, 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 population of, uh, uh, serving uh, population serving overseas, uh, we have a uh, uh, big number, uh, you know, about 40,000 uh, outside Sri Lanka, and we had to open uh, a country for them. So uh, we started taking uh, arrivals, and uh, we got 643 uh, infected uh, uh, patients uh, from arrivals. And uh, so when you leave the, uh, those two. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, segments. Actually, in Sri Lanka, we got 313. Uh, in, in fact, so uh, the, these 313 uh, from about uh, four clusters, and uh, uh, the, the cases were uh, in many uh, parts of Sri Lanka. And uh, as uh, Vietnam uh, uh, did, uh, we also based on quarantine. Uh, 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 to greater extent, but I see a uh, difference between Vietnam and Sri Lanka. I saw the, the Vietnam uh, basically used uh, home quarantine uh, more than uh, the other modes of quarantine. Uh, but our the main mode of quarantine uh, was later on uh, the institutional quarantine. But we, we started off from uh, home quarantine, but then thereafter uh, we moved uh, over to institutional uh, quarantine. Now, our strategies were initially uh, try and prevent uh, the virus coming into country. Uh, you know, we, we, I don't say we were, uh, you know, not successful. I think any country uh, wouldn't be able to, you know, uh, the, the guard uh, that much. So we had our uh, good time, but then ultimately virus came into country. And then thereafter, uh, we actually, what we did was we try, we prevented uh, social transmission, which actually uh, was the successful story. Otherwise, out of this uh, 313, I think uh, going by the geography uh, of uh, the, 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 the cases, uh, I think uh, this would have uh, resulted in a, a disaster unless uh, uh, for the very uh, strict and uh, uh, very formidable uh, control measures uh, that were taken uh, by the uh, Sri Lankan uh, government. Now, uh, initially, we were on to passive surveillance. Uh, we set up some uh, hospitals around the country, about uh, uh, starting uh, from 12 hospitals, and now there are about uh, more than 30 hospitals. Uh, but then uh, we, we shifted from this passive uh, surveillance to active surveillance. Uh, so uh, uh, so that, that also uh, uh, resulted in early uh, diagnosis of these uh, patients and then contact tracing and, uh, uh, of course, uh, quarantine. So, uh, uh, and, and uh, also when you uh, uh, take Vietnam and Sri Lanka, as the previous speaker mentioned, uh, the, the Vietnam was uh, sort of fortunate to have uh, experienced uh, the other viral disease uh, 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 epidemics, uh, uh, but we were uh, we, we we didn't experience much. But uh, now uh, uh, now onwards, actually, while uh, we were combating uh, COVID-19, the Sri Lankan government uh, started taking a formidable steps uh, for institutionalizing preparedness. Uh, you know, for future uh, similar epidemics. So therefore. Uh, you know, uh, through our uh, the development partners and, and, and also uh, uh, 
by the government of Sri Lanka. Uh, we are institutionalizing in the sense uh, we are uh, going to uh, have uh, the, 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 the structures uh, for uh, <laughs> this kind of uh, situation, the hospitals and the, the facilities and methods. Uh, we, we have already, we are, we are already uh, developing. So this is the, 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 the uh, good part of it. Uh, because uh, uh, though, you know, we, we just uh, uh, slightly, you know, uh, experienced uh, this previous, uh, 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 for example, SARS uh, uh, during uh, uh, SARS uh, period, uh, though we didn't have cases, uh, there was some uh, preparedness we were trying at, but this time uh, we actually uh, experienced this COVID-19 uh, uh, in, 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 in reality and the, the government and the public and the institutions, every uh, body went through this uh, COVID-19. So therefore, uh, therefore uh, we, we are fully geared uh, for institutionalizing uh, for future, uh, future threats. Uh, 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 so uh, this is what uh, I could uh, uh, say. Uh, if there are any, anything to add, please uh, let us know. Thank you very yes, much. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Anil. Thank you. Very informative. And again, I think we, uh, uh, Sri Lanka's response deserves also salutation and appreciation for, uh, for, uh, for the results taken. I have two questions, so maybe you can even elaborate more on some of the questions. Maybe um, the first one is about... Uh, um, is from Eastbourne uh, Rutnam, he's a senior journalist. And um, so these are questions coming both from the Facebook and from our Zoom connections. So first, the first question is noting the contrast in Vietnam, hesitance to reopen uh, for tourism, despite controlling the pandemic to Sri Lanka, uh, to Sri Lanka, which is planning to reopen its borders in August. Is Vietnam worried about a second wave uh, uh, for, of the disease? And that is why the reason for the greater concern. So this is the first question. And the second question is, uh, um, Vietnam put in a lot of effort into research and testing. Is Sri Lanka behind in this regard? And what can we learn from Vietnam to be more innovative? Um, and this is from Kevin Hertz, and maybe this can uh, Dr. Anil can respond to. So uh, maybe first, Dr. Uh, Bales, if you want to uh, answer the first one. Um, yes. So I've been uh, speaking with the ministry people, and and they're really concerned about having a new outbreak, uh, it spreading into the community. So they're being extremely cautious and taking. The, the risk for them of opening up for one sector, um, which would then possibly compromise the entire economy. So they're, they're very reluctant to do that. So I, I saw that there are plans for Sri Lanka to try to have a safe international tourism with sort of quarantine hotels. And I, I asked if Vietnam would be interested and they said, no, no, <laughs> not yet. We want to be sure that, um, that there's really no risk of, of having another wave of, of the epidemic. So I think they, they feel very happy that they were able to control it and that the population is able to go back to normal life within the country. And I think that it's, um, it's too risky, I think, for the government to, to take the risk of, of opening up to the global economy without having this two weeks quarantine that they have in place. Um, so I, I think they are afraid and I think they would call it the third wave because they had a first yeah. wave with uh -huh. case. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Bales. Uh, Dr. Uh, Ani? Uh, now, uh, when it comes to testing, right? Uh, now, we always believed in targeted uh, testing, uh, right? Uh, so, we, we were quite sure that uh, we didn't experience uh, social transmission in this country. So, uh, and uh, targeted in the sense uh, we targeted vulnerable uh, populations uh, where the, the virus could be. Uh, uh, and uh, now 
when uh, when we analyze our the positivity rate uh, of uh, uh, pcr testing it's actually it's about 2% uh, uh, you know uh, the positivity rate which is a very low uh, low rate now this is this 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 shows that now the where now we we targeted and uh, did the pcr testing and we get a uh, the positivity rate of two uh, percent. You know, just uh, just increasing the number of uh, testing, uh, uh, like any other country, uh, only we could you know the further uh, the, the reduce the uh, positivity uh, rate. Uh, the the now there are differences now when it comes to uh, say uh, South Korea or China, where the social transmission uh, uh, existed. There, of course, uh, you could, you know, uh, liberally uh, go out and uh, do testing. But uh, uh, at no point uh, we did want to, you know, uh, go out and uh, do testing liberally. Uh, but if you take, we, 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 we do about uh, 1,500 to 2,000 uh, tests per day, and they are very much targeted. And when it comes to research, uh, of course, I... I agree to, ex to some extent that uh, uh, Sri Lanka may uh, may have not done much uh, with regard to research on uh, the COVID-19. Uh, but I would say uh, 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 we have uh, produced certain uh, the the uh, items uh, with regard to uh, PCR testing. Uh, for example, uh, SOPs now we produce. And then uh, the the transport media we produce, and then a PCR test kit uh, also we produce uh, by a private uh, uh, company. Uh, uh, but uh, we 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 have you know it's it's not all over. Uh, so therefore, uh, uh, and and we some of these items we have exported as well. Uh, but when it comes to uh, 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 the other research areas. Uh, uh, we also do some uh, research uh, in collaboration with uh, uh, Ayurvedic uh, 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 physicians as well. And also we have a, a, a team on innovations and uh, uh, we are in the uh, you know, process of uh, producing uh, some items uh, that, that, that can be uh, used in uh, future and even have a local initiatives uh, you know, all over the country. Uh, there was enthusiasm among uh, uh, especially young people, and uh, uh, you know there were some some uh, you know innovations uh, taking place uh, in in the country. Thank you, thank you, thank you Dr. Uh, Anil. Thank you, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Sara. I think a very, very extremely beneficial experience that, uh, and uh, lots of lessons learned to, uh, uh, to learn from. I like the innovations very much, the rice, ATM, rice, uh, ATM rice machine, and of course, lots of other things. But uh, thank you, and I'm sure my, our, uh, my colleagues and friends from Sri Lanka uh, also have a lot to share, and I think we'll uh, benefit a lot also out of these uh, um, a very interesting, a very excellent, actually, uh, lessons learned. So now, uh, without further ado, I move uh, uh, very quickly to Singapore. And uh, we are very pleased to introduce our uh, two panelists, uh, Dr. Ruben Eng from the Lee Kuan uh, Yew School of Public Policy. Uh, he is trained as a behavioral scientist at NUS, Oxford and Yale. He spent 16 years in government, uh, consulting and research. In government, uh, he was in the Singapore Prime Minister's office, driving evidence-based policy making through data analytics and Singapore's smart nation strategies, and is an expert in measuring social perceptions. In his presentation, Dr. Rubin will use big data analysis to demonstrate how societal narratives of COVID-19 have evolved with the pandemic. Is there a global convergence or divergence? What are the global, regional, and local similarities and differences? 
I also have Dr. Patrick Daly from the Earth Observatory of Singapore. His research focuses on long-term human environmental relationships, the impact of natural hazards and conflicts upon societies, post-disasters recovery, humanitarian and cultural heritage. At, um, at the uh, EOS, he oversees the Hazards and Society Research Group, which has ongoing projects in, in Indonesia and in Nepal. This morning, he will also use recent data collected in Singapore to discuss how citizens perceive the risks and impacts and how they have been adapting to cope with the mitigation measures and how some segments of the population are disproportionately impacted by both the virus and the cure. We, as, again, as uh, we did at the, um, the Q&A, uh, we'll come after both presentations. So, over to you, Dr. Ruben. Good morning to all of you. Thank you, Hannah, for that uh, very generous uh, introduction. Um, maybe before I begin, uh, I just want to say thank you to all of you for your commitment and sacrifice, uh, both personally and professionally, to contain the, the epidemic. So my deep gratitude and appreciation. Uh, let me share, I have uh, just a few slides. Let me share that with you. Um, okay, so... Uh, Good morning again. My name is uh, Ruben Ng. As you can see here, my family name or last name here, surname, uh, does not have any vowels. So when I was in the US and UK, people struggled to pronounce uh, NG. They always thought it's an abbreviation for no good. But I told them, no, no, it's not no good. It's nice guy. Um, so as I speak, you may hear planes flying in the background. So uh, I apologize for that. I live quite near the airport. Uh, but I'm, I'm quite heartened by this because if there are planes flying by, that means uh, the aviation industry is alive and well. But it's also quite torturous because I see planes flying by, yet I can't get on any of them. So uh, today's presentation uh, on Singapore will have two parts. The first part, uh, I'm going to take you through some, some macro or global narratives of COVID-19, whether there's a convergence or divergence. And then Patrick will take you through more the uh, individual level perceptions uh, in Singapore itself. Okay, so there will be two parts. So uh, this is the agenda of uh, my uh, very short talk today. The first is uh, really measuring societal perceptions and narratives. Uh, uh, just a brief background. And secondly, um, we are going to be talking about distinct phases of COVID-19 narratives globally. We'll compare uh, regional narratives as well as uh, and highlight Singapore. The third, I'll just share some reflections based on the data. So currently, uh, how do we measure societal perceptions? There are two ways. Uh, one is through focus groups, which may be deep. Uh, you get deep insights, but not so generalizable. The other would be surveys. But surveys and focus groups cannot answer two questions. The first is, how have societal perceptions or narratives changed over the past 100 or 200 years? Uh, surveys can't do that unless you have done that same survey over the same 100 or 200 years. But to date, we have Pew Research Gallup. The most we have is 40, 50 years. So we, we cannot answer the question of how societal narratives have changed over the past 100 or 200 years. And that's important because in the past 100, 200 years, we have had different epidemics. We have had flu epidemics, different kinds of epidemics. And it's very important to study then societal narratives, how it's impacted uh, by different epidemics and how government responses impact those epidemics and so on. Um, the other limitation of surveys and focus groups is that it cannot uh, analyze perceptions as they are changing by the day. With a fast-moving pandemic and government actions like COVID-19, we need a tool, we need some innovations to be able to dynamically track uh, how perceptions are moving. And that's important because it impacts government uh, com communications. Sometimes the intention of how we want to communicate is not how it's perceived. So if we know it quickly, we can shift and uh, change our uh, government comms uh, to make sure it's perceived in the right way. So I'm going to share with you some innovations that we have uh, to uh, mitigate some of these limitations. So we have created, in collaboration with Linguist, a global narratives platform. So this is a 10 billion word online database with sources from over 7,000 newspapers across 20 countries over 10 years. 
And this is a dynamic corpus because every week we add 40 million new words to this particular corpus to help us understand uh, dynamically uh, what is really the Pau society, what's, what's the, what are the conversations going on globally. It can be used for any other topic. And this is the biggest cross-cultural corpus globally. And these are the 20 countries. We have several countries in Asia, uh, several countries in Africa, North America, Oceania, as well as uh, UK, Ireland, and Jamaica. So these are what we found in our analysis. There are three distinct phases so far of COVID-19 narratives. The first is uh, pre-pandemic, as you can see here. Pre-pandemic, uh, it's pretty much uh, quite diverse. Uh, the topics are similar, like infectious disease. We talk about that in Africa. We talk about uh, infectious disease and chronic disease. We talk about that across different regions around the world. But the topics are quite diverse. For example, in the US, when, we, uh, when they talk about general health care is about Lyme disease. In Singapore, it could be dengue fever. Uh, in Africa, it could be HIV AIDS and so on. So th there's some diversity. Uh, early pandemic, it's where it starts to converge. So early pandemic, you have breaking news, initial reports and virus transmission. And peak pandemic, that's where you see a real convergence that mirrors really the global nature of this particular pandemic. So there's testing, treatment, government mitigation met, uh, measures, mortality concerns and so on. So this is, there are three distinct phases towards the end of the phase, uh, peak pandemic, we see a great convergence. Uh, I'm waiting for more data coming in from May and June. Uh, that is, I hope we can call it the post pandemic. Um, so now I'm going to show you uh, regionally, from a region's perspective, what are some differences. This slide shows uh, the COVID-19 narratives in Asia. Um, as you can see here, it's more a traffic light system. So uh, the green perspective, uh, sort of non-COVID items, uh, very generic sort of narratives. The orange one is where you have the initial onset, initial reportings, people, uh, it starts to get traction in the media. And the red is really about a peak pandemic COVID-19. So as you can see here in, in Asia, uh, it peaked earlier and, and really peaked in February. Uh, this picture is quite different from, say, in the US, in this current slide, slide 7. In the US, COVID-19 narratives really peaked in April, uh, very different from uh, the February peak in Asia. I think this also mirrors the spread of COVID-19 across both regions. In the UK, the next slide I'm going to show in the UK slide is very interesting uh, because, as you can see here, um, most other countries went from green and there's some orange and then to red. But in the UK, it moved very quickly from green to red. So they, 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 I think the seriousness of it was, uh, came up very strongly in the narrative uh, from just very generic non-COVID items immediately in, into uh, peak pandemic narratives. So that to me is quite interesting from a regional perspective. Uh, how about Singapore? Next slide, slide nine is going to be about Singapore. So Singapore, uh, it's very interesting because uh, it started, uh, we, we lingered for quite a while uh, in this uh, pre-pandemic phase where there was a lot of narratives for almost two months about initial reports, initial transmission. This really mirrors that because the first wave didn't hit us very uh, strongly. Uh, I, I think the, the second wave uh, sort of peaked around March or April. So um, against that background, uh, just some reflections. I think innovative techniques are needed to dynamically track changing narratives during a pandemic. Uh, that maybe current traditional methods uh, of surveys and focus groups do not. Um, I'm not saying that these techniques should replace that. I think we should, those techniques are important, I use them a lot, but I think we should start to triangulate the insights using both focus groups, surveys, as well as this kind of uh, global narratives platform, which we call Psychomix. And what surprises me is that social narratives could serve as a mirror to a pandemic's progress. Uh, it, as you can see, the, the traffic light system where you have green, uh, orange and, and red really mirrored uh, the number of cases and mortality rates. And because we are triangulating the insight from societal narratives, using multiple methods will actually help identify the blind spots as well. For example, uh, if the narratives are picking up that there's something that uh, people are worried about or people are talking about that we previously have not uh, thought about, uh, I think that's something uh, we can address. A third, I think it's important to uh, move from nudges to narratives. Most of us would have heard of the behavioral insights perspective. Let, let's nudge people towards different behavior. But I'd like to offer a different perspective whereby nudges without narrative, when you have nudges without narratives, the behavioral change may not be permanent. So you need to really align what people think, which is the narratives, and how people uh, behave to get permanent behavioral change. Because you know, narratives can go viral, but nudges can't, right? 
Uh, so I think narratives can serve as a powerful tool to shift behavior. If we get it right, if we put, uh, if we, if we, uh, if a narrative take root, it can really shift behavior. I think uh, the lesson here is also that uh, it is very essential for governments to own and shape the narrative during a pandemic. Because if there's a vacuum, uh, if governments are not out there owning and shaping the narrative during a pandemic, if there's a, if a, if there's a vacuum, I think a lot of other false narratives and misinformation will then take root and grow. Um, and just to add on from uh, Sarah's earlier point about public comms, I think public comms is really a very critical last month in any policy implementation. You know, we have the policy agenda setting, we have great strategy, great implementation, but if we don't communicate that properly, uh, all those good work that we have done previously would be wasted. So I, I, I would challenge all of us to really pay attention to how we communicate some of these things, because if we communicate that right, I think it augments and multiplies the effect of good policy strategies and implementation. The next is, uh, I think we realized from a Singapore experience that we need to customize the narrative because um, from a government comms perspective, we realized that one size fits all does not really work. The way we communicate and get people uh, uh, to follow a certain behavior to reduce the risk of the pandemic spreading would be very different from when we communicate to an older population versus a younger population, for example, because it, it means differently to different people. So I think narrative customization is very critical. And using techniques like this, we understand what are the prevailing narratives, uh, what are the uh, narratives, narratives that may be wrong in different age groups, then we can try to correct them uh, in a very targeted manner. Finally, I think uh, to look ahead, I think the question we want to ask ourselves is, then from a country, from a government, or from an international organization perspective, what is our recovery and resilience narrative? Because if we set the narrative right, it could change behavior, it could mobilize society towards a faster recovery and increase resilience. With that, thank you very much. I'll hand it over to Hannah and, and Patrick. Thank you. Thank you, Ruben. Um, I'm afraid to pronounce your uh, second name, so I'll say a nice guy. Ruben, nice guy. I think this uh, sounds thank you. nice. All right, until I learn how to pronounce it correctly. Thank you very much. And um, um, I think uh, just to make use of the, uh, the time, we move uh, to Dr. Patrick Daly and then we open the discussion uh, the, for the discussions. Hello, I am yes. Patrick Daly from the Earth Observatory of Singapore, and I'm collaborating with Ruben and Carolyn Brassard and a number of other colleagues on a study here in Singapore trying to better understand the impacts of the mitigation measures upon the population, and in particular, trying to understand how different segments of the population weigh the cost and the burden of mitigation measures versus the, po the potential downside of actual COVID itself. And I think our broader rationale behind this beyond COVID is whether you deal with natural hazards or climate change, one of the, the, the great questions is how do you get compliance with mitigation measures? They all cost something. So how do you get big buy-in? And seeing what Ruben was talking about and also uh, what Sarah shared from Vietnam, you see that getting large collective buy-in to mitigation measures can be absolutely essential to handle a crisis such as COVID. I think we're also seeing in some other countries, including my own in the United States, not getting that consistent cohesive buy-in has led to the situation kind of falling apart somewhat. And so this fundamental question of you know, is the cure worse than the disease in that sense? And how do you kind of build up a platform for promoting mitigation measures successfully? And I'm gonna share a bit about that with you today. First, I'm gonna give a little bit of an overview about the COVID situation in Singapore. And in, as of early April, I would say our situation was actually quite similar to what Vietnam had in terms of infection rates and things like that. We kind of had half mitigation measures at that point. We had kind of closed down borders. We were taking regular temperature. Uh, tests, people were wearing masks, but things were still sort of open. Uh, and we thought we had it well under control, but then in April, we actually had a, a, a big spike and, and it was caused by two things. One is we had, a, as other countries in Europe and the United States started peaking, we had a massive repatriation of Singaporean citizens and residents from these areas, from London, from New York, coming back in. And that brought in some imported cases. But also, as much as Singapore has been prepared for this, I mean, Singapore dealt with SARS as well. They had protocol on how to deal with pandemics, and this is something they're very well versed on. Uh, but one major issue sort of slipped through the cracks of the planning, 
and you see all the yellow bars on the graph here, those represent migrant workers, lower wage migrant workers, mainly from China or South Asia, uh, who come here to work in construction projects and things like that. And many of these men live in dormitories. And so you actually see them segregated as a separate character of person. Uh, and these dormitories are sort of a little out of sight, out of mind here in Singapore, but they have hundreds of thousands of residents within them, often five, 10 persons to a room. So very dense sort of, uh, sort of environments there. And once the infection spread there and wasn't picked up right away, it, it, it went with wildfire. And so over 90% of the cases we've had here in Singapore have been foreign workers, migrant workers living in these dorm environments. Uh, and so that has kind of changed our, our numbers quite dramatically. Uh, but overall, we've had just under 40,000 cases, uh, only 25 deaths to date. And there's been a system of kind of, as, as within Vietnam as well, of sort of taking severe cases, putting them in government facilities and hospitals, and then isolation wards afterwards, and then having home quarantine. So there's been a, a range of ways to kind of isolate people from the population who are either infected or possibly had contact with someone who was infected. Uh, Singapore calls it the circuit breaker. So their mitigation measures are what they call the circuit breaker. And the official circuit breaker that's underway now started in, in early April. And it's very similar to, I think, what many other countries around the region are doing. So it's a, a combination of border controls shutting down non-essential businesses. Uh, so you still have sort of food places open for takeout, delivery, those sort of things. Medical facilities are open, but most retail and a lot of manufacturing is closed at the time being. Uh, a, big, a big push from both learning and uh, working from home. So as an academic, we were all basically deemed non-essential right away and told we could do our work from anywhere. Uh, so don't come to the campus for a few months. So the idea of kind of closing non-essential facilities, keeping people at home, uh, lessening the sort of traffic on public transport has been a major policy. Uh, with the migrant worker dorms, the government stepped in once they realized it was a problem and they uh, have actually dedicated a huge amount of resources to isolating the dorms, separating out, testing, mass testing the dorms, separating out sick workers from ones who are capable, who are, who are healthy, uh, and also trying to determine which workers that are healthy are actually really essential. And they've been further isolated in other areas so they can continue working without kind of getting sort of uh, getting infected. Uh, it's now very common to have contact tracing and screening. Anytime you walk into a a store or a mall or a shopping center or something of that sort, you scan a little barcode with your phone or you show your national ID. They check you in and out of most public spaces now. Uh, and as there's also an app, there's also an app we have on our phones to facilitate contact tracing. And at this point, the government is actually thinking about uh, distributing a tracking device to all residents in Singapore because the app itself is, you know, it's restricted to people who have certain types of phones. So the idea potentially is to have everyone in Singapore having a contact tracing sort of chip or device with them so they can really sort of use technology to isolate who may be sick or who may have come in contact with someone who's sick. Uh, the government has also spent an enormous amount of money by Singaporean standards in terms of the, the size of the population uh, to support sort of residents, citizens, and businesses. So we've had three sort of extra special budgets that have come out, you know, tens of billions of dollars each to prop up and support sort of employment businesses. And almost all of this money is coming out of Singapore's national reserves. So for many years, Singapore has built up a rainy day fund uh, and they've often cited it as being important for resilience in the, in the face of a downturn, but we almost never use it. And so this has been a situation where the government very quickly and on a very large scale has been mobilizing its technology and also its resources to try to you know, not just combat the disease, but to try to keep uh, Singapore functioning as normally as possible. So that's kind of the, the broad picture of where we're at in terms of mitigation measures and response. Uh, now, my colleagues and I have been doing a survey. One part of our survey is dealing with a quantitative survey we're conducting with YouGov to look at how the mitigation measures are affecting the population and seeing how people are trying to balance this trade-off between the impacts of the mitigation measures versus the risk of COVID. So that's kind of our, our broad theme that we're perceiving. And I wanna share some very preliminary data with you today to shed some light on some of these issues. And so in this presentation, I'll show you some data about the impacts of COVID in the circuit breaker. And I'll discuss a bit about what we think about these trade-offs. 
Uh, but there mm -hmm. are two major caveats. One is this is very preliminary. We're just getting data in This is a real time survey. So we haven't had time to do extensive analysis. Uh, so it's more just to give a look at some of the, the, the first order data. And second, and this is a huge issue, our data from this survey is statistically representative of Singaporean citizens and permanent residents. It does not include other categories of workers and especially not the sort of the, the people working, the, 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 the migrant workers who are living in the dorms. And so as part of our research methodology, we are going to be conducting follow up and punched in qualitative surveys amongst different types of uh, populations that may be marginalized from, the, from, from this survey. Now, <clears throat> when we look at the impact, I'll go right into the data here and I'll point out a few of the issues that I think are interesting at first glance. Uh, first off, there's quite a lot of optimism as of this week that Singapore is doing very well. Right? So you see on the left there, about 70% of the Singaporeans suggest that things are getting better here. Uh, when I looked at the data for their perspective on outside of Singapore, it was about 50%, right? So people see the situation in Singapore sort of getting worse, not many, less than 20% uh, getting better, less than 20% think it's getting worse. So we're on a, I think there's a lot of optimism here that things are being well managed and we're on a, a positive sort of trajectory. Uh, when we look at the real impacts of COVID, uh, for many people, it's actually the impacts of the mitigation measures. It's the impacts of not going to work, right? That's what a lot of people are dealing with on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. uh, and some interesting sort of uh, bits of data pop out right away. First mm -hmm. off, the economic impact is being felt, but it's not nearly as great as we anticipated. Mm -hmm. So we're finding that, as you see in the middle table, about 41% of our respondents suggest that household income has been disrupted. But when we look to the, to the table on, on my right side, uh, less than about 25% of, of households will say that they don't have enough income, don't have enough financial resources, which is a problem. And it's important for the government to really understand who these people are and, and try to find better ways to approach them. Uh, but I don't think from an economic point of view at the household level, it has been as catastrophic in some other countries. Mm -hmm. uh, but we are seeing much higher rates of, of impact in terms of things like socializing, visiting family, visiting relatives. Mm -hmm. Singapore is actually a very, a very small country. It's very densely populated, but it's, you know, there's a lot of going around to see grandma and grandpa and the kids and these things. And there's the isolation has have other social impacts that, that have been very pronounced. Uh, and so that was quite interesting. If the impacts here, yes, there are real economic consequences, but the majority of our respondents who are concerned are more concerned at the moment about things like the social interaction and their family life and these sort of issues. Mm -hmm. uh, when we move on to the, the next one here, we are asking people to try to weigh whether or not the impact on them as an individual of these mitigation measures, uh, staying at home, wearing masks, social distancing, contact tracing, you know, whether that impact was worth it you know, for the greater good of themselves, their family and community. And the data here is very, very stark. I mean, if we look at the, the third column uh, on the right side, agree, you know, we find that the vast majority of our respondents across the board agree that the restrictions on personal mobility, the restrictions on their employment and the restrictions on their personal privacy are well worth making for the greater good. So there's quite a lot of buy-in to that, which we mm -hmm. found quite interesting. And if you look at the dis disagree column, less than 10% would disagree with any of these statements, which I actually thought I was a little surprised by how low that is. But this is a fairly good indicator that you're getting wide level of compliance, but not just wide level of compliance, you're getting a wide level of people accepting that these measures are appropriate and worthwhile, right? And I think that is, to go back to that earlier question about mitigation measures, it's that feeling of things being worthwhile that I think are very important. I suspect our inference at this stage, which is very premature, is that if people did not think the measures were effective, mm -hmm. I think you'd see a very different response here. But because people are seeing progress and trust in the process, I think they're willing to take this risk at a personal level or assume the burdens for a greater good because they think mm -hmm. it's going to end in a successful result. Uh, and another thing that's sort of related to this that is interesting is we ask people to rank, you know, in terms of, you know, put them in a position, if you're in charge of designing public policy in Singapore, if you're 
if you have to decide on when to adjust the circuit breaker measures to make them more relaxed, which variables do you think are most important? And as you can see in the column on, on the left side there, uh, under the first choice, 7% uh, of our respondents said health and safety, and everything else was a distant second, third, and fourth. Uh, so overwhelmingly, the population here believes that decisions about the circuit breaker measure should be made based upon public health data, public health inf information. Economics and livelihoods is there, but it, I was rather surprised to see that only at 18%. Uh, so that I think that may suggest a combination of a real concern with the public health issues, uh, a realization that these other issues will start to go away when the public health situation is contained, uh, and also a sense that a lot of the population here seems a little bit buffered from ec negative economic impact. It mm -hmm. is a very overall affluent country uh, for a lot of its citizens and residents uh, with fairly high savings rates, and the government has been incredibly proactive to provide buffer zones. So I think a lot of residents have been shielded from these you know, the adverse economic impact, which I think you know, yeah. shows up in the data right here. Yes. Of course, uh, that is not everyone. Uh, uh -huh. Now, if we go to the next slide here, uh, we are trying to get a more fine, a sort of more sort of fine grained sort of look at compliance. So breaking down these circuit breakers to individual components to see how much people believe, believed in them or were complying. Uh, and the column on the left side, so at present, that is people right now, what do they think about these different circuit breaker measures? And you know, relatively uh, high numbers of people think things like social distancing, protecting elderly and vulnerable staying at home. Uh, everyone should be wearing a mask. You're getting 75, 80% of the population or higher agreeing with these basic sort of uh, public health measures, which I think is also very important for compliance. Uh, surprisingly though, only 36% of people think everyone should be tested. Now we heard from Sarah that testing has been a very sort of pronounced thing in Vietnam, really scaling that up. It's not nearly as prevalent here. And it seems that the population isn't as worried about testing. So there isn't a, a giant popular sort of push for testing here. Uh, it's also quite interesting. I think there's one point there where it says at present, the restrictions should be applied only in infected areas, but not anywhere, but not everywhere. Only 22% of the population agrees with that. And I think when we unpack that, that's very important because most of the population here is very aware that the dense clusters are in migrant worker communities within these dorm environments, right? So you're not getting wide scale public sentiment from the data that those areas should be only under lockdown and everyone else should be open. I think there's a sense that they are under isolation, but all the rest of us have to be kind of cautious too. Mm -hmm. And I think that is, is, is also, uh, also quite interesting. Okay. And on the table on the right side, just about done, the table on the right side there, uh, we were trying to figure out, will these measures endure? How long will they go on for? And so we asked people, how long would they engage with these activities? Or would they see these activities being part of their post-COVID life? And across the board, very high percentages of people seem willing to continue utilizing these different mitigation measures going forward. Uh, so Hannah seems to be indicating we're kind of running out of time there. So. Uh, I'll, I'll sort of go briefly through my last two slides. Uh, but uh, the key points we're finding is the circuit breaker is a burden, but it's not existential for many of our population here. Uh, for many households, the circuit breaker is not seen as worse than the virus itself. Uh, but we're finding that many of our respondents are people who are, are coming from the citizen to permanent residence. So it's, I think we're missing certain segments of the population in our data, which is gonna require us to punch in, in, in deeper there. Uh, but it is very positive, I think, for Singapore and its government's COVID task force to see that many people are accepting the personal burdens of the, of the circuit breaker measures for the public good. Uh, and many people are willing to continue this. And when we think about why that is, I think it comes back to both what Sarah and Ruben said in their, in their presentations. I think there's quite a high level of trust here at the moment in the government and its handling. I think a lot of that comes from the flow of information. And it's very top down here as, it's, as Singapore is, but there's tremendous efforts to communicate within the wider population, to explain the mitigation measures, to share very detailed data about cases, infections. And I think quite a lot of people here in the population are comforted by this flow of information. And so I think that transparency and at times the willingness to admit when things were wrong and change course in a public way has really given a lot of people in Singapore a lot of confidence in, in the, the government's response here. 
Okay, so I'll end on that point so we could then shift over to the Q&A and discussion. Thank you very much. Um, really highly appreciated. Uh, again, let me just uh, pick on some of the uh, uh, highlights of uh, the two presentations uh, so that we can open up for uh, the um, uh, discussions. So, uh, um, latest, uh, first on uh, Dr. Ruben Nug. Uh, first, uh, fast-moving uh, social narratives, the intention of what governments uh, uh, want to communicate is not always what is perceived by people. And the second highlight uh, in, uh, is uh, in Asia, concerns moving uh, from mortality issues to socioeconomic concerns is a good example of how public priorities will keep shifting even as governments have uh, a chance uh, to balance uh, health risks uh, with the economic recovery. Um, and then I think the, the, the point is, what is our recovery and uh, resilience narrative? So the narrative, how, how do we present our narrative is very important. Now, uh, the, in Dr. Dali's uh, presentation, now it's a sovereign uh, lessons of, uh, uh, of Singapore of how after an initial strong response, so a second wave, mainly due to missing out on risks of migrant uh, workers living in dormitories. Very also relevant to, uh, to our case here. Um, emphasizing the importance of leave, leaving no one behind. Uh, second highlight was the innovation such as the apps for contact tracing and government considering distributing contact tracing devices to all its citizens. Um, also highlights about the special uh, budget, uh, three special budgets uh, passed to support socioeconomic uh, resilience, but despite the positive trajectory, many people were still impacted by the mitigation measures like the lockdowns. Now, uh, the, just like the uh, fourth highlights is uh, surveys also showing high concerns of disruption fam of uh, family life but general acceptance of the sacrifices needed to manage the health uh, uh, crisis um, and the response, which uh, was very important to the government to maintain the trust and the support. So key takeaway again is government maintaining high level of trust and shielding population from economic impact largely successful. So we, now with this, um, uh, we are uh, a little bit uh, quite delayed, but I think the discussion is so uh, relevant and so important for us. So I ask for your uh, patience to stay a little bit longer with us. And now I'll give, um, I'll ask our discussants for to, to also uh, to uh, for the uh, patients as well to, to, to comment uh, or to give their comments in maximum two minutes uh, so that we give a little bit uh, more time for the also Q&A. But I'm really pleased and very uh, um, heartened to have such high level of uh, uh, distinguished discussions among uh, uh, the participants today. So uh, our first uh, comment that I'd like to call upon is from Admiral Jatna Kolombaj, who uh, is the additional secretary to the president uh, for uh, foreign relations. And he draws his uh, expertise from wide ranging career of senior military service, academia and policy making. And as you can imagine how busy he is. So, um, and uh, our second comment will come from Dilan Fernando, and uh, who is the chairman of the UN Global Compact Network in Sri Lanka, and the local chapter of the world's largest corporate citizenship initiative. He is the CEO of uh, Dilma Silonti Company. Thank you. And uh, then we have uh, uh, Saroj Jayasinga, who is a professor in the Department of Clinical Medicine, Faculty of Medicine, Colombo, in Sri Lanka, and is the honorary con, uh, consultant physician to the National Hospital of Sri Lanka. His uh, research interest includes innovations in clinical uh, teaching, health uh, equality, equity, social determinants of health, uh, and application of complexity science to clinical medicine and population health, uh, uh, thank you very much for uh, coming on board. 
and uh, Dr. Uh, Indrajit uh, Kumaraswamy, who is a familiar name to all of us, I assume, and was the governor of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka from 2016 to 2019, and draws from a wide range of public policy and private uh, sector experience. Most recently, he chaired also the Pathfinder Foundation report on Sri Lanka's COVID-19 recovery. Fantastic, really distinguished discussion. So uh, with this, um, may I ask uh, Admiral Jayatna to, uh, to provide the first comment, please? Yeah, uh, three months after the World Health Organization declared COVID is a pandemic, we are still struggling to find answers to political, economic, and social impact of the virus. In fact, the resilience of the entire world, and especially so in a country like Sri Lanka, is being tested. How can we come back to normal, or will we ever be normal, or will we have to live in a new normal? So this is the question that is begging answers. I will not go into the detail about the success of the, uh, the or the methodology of uh, Sri Lankan case, but I like to highlight the very few points uh, of the our strategy, the cornerstone of our strategy. Number one was prevention. Number two was life matters. The life was very valuable to us, not necessarily human rights, but the right to life. And then third was the humanitarian aspect. These three were the cornerstones of our policy for uh, uh, COVID. Now we engage in testing, tracing, and treatment. And now, of course, we are trying to, on a phase basis, on an exit strategy, kind of a lockout. And we are planning to uh, open our school. And I think Dr. Anil Jasinga mentioned last 40 days, we haven't had a single case coming from our community. So that's a very good uh, uh, success story for us. Now, how will we behave in the post COVID? I don't know, I think it's too early to say post COVID because I think we will have to live with this COVID for a while. In a post COVID world or in this COVID world, how will uh, our international relations will be governed? That is a question that we all need to find answers. And what will be the role of international organization like the United Nations for that matter? We know the World Health Organization did a great job, but there were questions raised about it, criticism leveled against uh, WHO. So has the value of international organization uh, gone down even slightly? These are the questions that we need to find in the uh, post COVID world. Now, this is uh, the, uh, countries like Sri Lanka, we are now discussing about our economic model because we were having an import-based economic model. We were basically doing transshipment cargo handling, but not much of a production. So these are some of the thoughts that I think we need to uh, speak. I'm sure these are common to many countries, but I only put the Sri Lankan perspective. And because of the time limitation, I will restrict my comments to now. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah, for inviting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very, uh, I, I think, extremely important uh, uh, points and extremely important uh, questioning also uh, noted. And thanks for the respect of the time as well. Hopefully you stay with us, please, for uh, the Q&A as well. Um, so can I turn to uh, uh, Dilan, please? Dilan Fernando, over to you. Thank you, Hannah. The, the themes of preparedness, the firm and science-based action, as well as the funding uh, and communication, etc., are very clear. But I think from a business perspective, I must say the Sri Lankan government has managed the process admirably because there has been the possibility of balancing the protection, the health and safety uh, priorities, whilst also permitting business to restart. But looking to the next stage as we all prepare our or, or revisit our business continuity plans, I think our questions are about a framework for building, um, as, as Dr. Jainab uh, talked about, the, the post-COVID environment. We have learned a lot during lockdown. We have learned about the importance of, of uh, virtual meetings. We have uh, redefined the schooling in a sense, and possibly even uh, helped us, uh, provided lessons for some of the situations we are going to have to face in this post-COVID environment. 
which is uh, the climate change, uh, also issues of inequality. And whilst technology is going to be a huge enabler, I think what the, the point I would like to, to leave with you is to, to understand how we have learned from this and how we can build our infrastructure, education, the awareness of people, uh, use technology as an, I mean, the, the wonderful example of the social listening tool as a barometer of public sentiment and therefore of public, the effectiveness of public reaction. That was fantastic. And those are the kind of tools we're going to need in future to help us to, to cope. Because as I think Dr. Konobage said, um, it is going to happen again. And I think the chaos and the, the uh, uh, difficulties that many people talk of in the future, uh, this is one of uh, uh, the, the first signs of that reality. So I think uh, I conclude by saying preparedness, let's learn from, uh, some, from the experience we have had, and let's make sure that next time round we will do it even better than what we have seen. But thank you, Anna. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, um, then I, uh, may I turn to uh, Dr. Uh, Saroj Jayasinga, please? Uh, thank you very much, Hannah. And uh, it's been a wonderful uh, set of lectures and discussions we've had. I'd like to share with you just uh, four points. Firstly, I think there wasn't uh, much discussion on the unique uh, political context we are having right now in Sri Lanka. Because uh, with the dissolution of the parliament, we've had the president uh, who, who is able to now uh, handle things uh, of the nation using a, with a with an interim cabinet. And this, I think, has allowed a policy space for a wide group of professionals and experts and uh, civil society groups uh, to input into government policies. So the model we have used is to have uh, task forces and uh, special national coordinating centers and so on. and. Uh, the previous speakers have led this in a remarkable way from Sh in Sri Lanka. So that's point number one. Point number two, if you are to learn from the experiences of these uh, presentations, we do not have a good social barometer. I think that's an area which we should be starting to work on, fund research, and to see how the perceptions of people are being affected. And uh, in the long term, we should be investing on biotechnology. And that's the, one of the winning uh, combinations which Vietnam had. And we don't have a biotechnology uh, industry to talk about. So that's something we have to think about. And of course, uh, we mentioned about the preparedness, uh, the necessity for us to be prepared for future COVID. This is going to come again and again. Uh, I mean, in different forms. So I think we'll have to be prepared. Uh, the final point is about the differences compared to the other countries is that our quarantine processes were very strict and we had curfews uh, and strict lockdowns, which was different from what Vietnam did and what Singapore has done. So we had curfews going throughout the country and it worked because, uh, you know, you have to uh, modify some of these depending on how people behave. So. Those are my comments. Thank you very much once again. And thank you to uh, the Sri Lankan, uh, the uh, defense uh, uh, establishment, the Ministry of Health and the government for keeping us relatively COVID free for almost 100 days. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jaisingal. I mean, I think uh, very relevant uh, comments and uh, uh, excellent uh, four points. Thank you. Um, uh, so Dr. Kumaraswamy, over to you. Um, online. Hello, can you now hear me? Yes, yes very well. Loud and okay. clear. I'm sorry, I had Thank muted you. myself. Thank you very much for thank you very much for inviting me and, and greetings to everybody from a rather cloudy London. Mm -hmm. um, uh, let me uh, I think our remit uh, is to kind of draw lessons from the excellent presentations that we heard uh, from our speakers. So let me quickly run through about four, five uh, takeaways that uh, I um, think are important. 
One is that both Vietnam and Singapore had a head start over Sri Lanka in the sense that they um, had experienced previous pandemics in, in uh, recent uh, decades. Uh, so Sri Lanka's success in containing and managing uh, the decision, uh, the, the pandemic rather, uh, is uh, even more creditable in that respect. And it was very encouraging to hear from Dr. Jasinga that the authorities are giving high priority to building institutional capacity in pandemic preparedness. So that, that's, I think, a very positive development. The second point I'd like to make is that um, what became has what became clear is that each country has its own political economy dynamics. Uh, as uh, Dr. Dinusha Panditharatna uh, pointed out, countries with different political models have had success in managing uh, the pandemic. But what is important is that the government is efficient and effective. Efficient and effective government action, whatever the political model, uh, seems to give uh, the desired outcomes. Uh, the third point is, uh, you know, in recent uh, years, there has been a school of thought that has uh, focused upon reducing the size of government. But what has become clear during the pandemic is that only the government has the capacity to respond to a shock uh, created by a pandemic uh, like, like, like the Corona-19, COVID-19 virus. So building government capacity, modernizing government, all that is important. But the point I'd really like to highlight is that given the fact that this is not going to be the last pandemic, I mean, experts say that we're going to have other pandemics. And I think uh, um, even speakers today anticipate having uh, future pandemics. And of course, uh, Sri Lanka, uh, in terms of vulnerability to climate change, is in the top five, six countries. And so in terms of the intensity and frequency of natural disasters, that is, again, uh, going to be a challenge for us. So the point I want to bring out is that have building buffers, building fiscal buffers, building buffers in terms of the country's external reserves are going to become more and more important. It's interesting that in Singapore, for instance, the government has been able to take uh, very ambitious measures in terms of providing financial support to households and uh, to businesses, even though the, the social barometer said that people don't need it. So in Singapore, the government has uh, buffers, households have buffers because it's a wealthy country. So I think going forward, this is going to be very important because in Sri Lanka, we like to live on the edge. And that's what we have done now for many, many decades. But I think we need a mindset change and we need to build these buffers if we are to deal with these pandemics, these natural disasters in the future. Then the next point is uh, in terms of uh, a lesson from Vietnam in terms of um, attracting foreign direct investment. They are being extremely agile in taking advantage of the reconfiguring of global supply chains in the post pandemic um, um, age. And here again, I think we have some lessons. And their initial stage in terms of the very successful record they have in terms of attracting FDI um, is worth studying. Right at the beginning, they were able to get Samsung. Samsung at one point accounted for 40% of their exports. So the lesson there is if one can get one or two very, very large investors, global names, the demonstration effect can then be leveraged to attract other FDI. So I think we can learn from from Vietnam as to what they're doing now in terms of penetrating these, uh, these uh, global and regional supply chains and the agility uh, that they're showing in terms of uh, achieving this. Um, the next point I'd like to make um, is that um, the role of technology and, and uh, uh, digitalization, I think everybody has emphasized that. It has become more and more clear. Uh, and I think that is another area where Sri Lanka needs to press on in terms of digitalizing not just our business environment, but also our government services. Uh, the next point relates to food security. Uh, I think what has become clear is that uh, there is always the danger of, of, of uh, global supply chains uh, in food getting disrupted as export bans come in. Uh, uh, so this is an area where we need to improve. Uh, in our agriculture, we have 25% of the workforce uh, producing 7% of GDP. So we have a very 
low productivity, low income agricultural sector, which we need to transform. And so we need to give the highest priority. We've known this for a long time. We've talked about it. We haven't really been done very much, but given this new normal that the world is going into, it is going to become much more important that we have a much more efficient agricultural sector. Uh, that's pretty much all that I want to share with you. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, and, uh, and again, I'd like to thank all the presenters as well as the discussants. Thank you, Dr. Kamaswamy. Very, very interesting again. And uh, I like your comment, uh, Sri Lankans always living on the edge. Yes. So, um, but um, well taken, I'm, uh, I'm sure. Um, Kulita, I'm going to start by three. I, we have uh, lots of questions, but let me start by the first three. And if time allows, we can, uh, we can uh, proceed for further. So for the presenters, I hope uh, all presenters, Dr. Sara and Dr. Dali and Dr. Anna, uh, are on, uh, online still. So I want to start by uh, the gender dimension of the violence uh, in Vietnam, sorry, the gender dimension of the crisis. So um, such as the, the spike in domestic uh, violence that, ha that we've seen in many countries, uh, uh, what, has, uh, what has been the experience uh, there and what was there any particular steps taken by the governments to deal uh, with this spike? So this is a first question. Um, the second question would be with a high debt burden. Sri Lanka has struggled to create the fiscal space for financing emergency recovery interventions like cash transfer program. So what fiscal and monetary measures did Vietnam or Singapore undertake to generate the fiscal space and reprioritize the expenditure? And the third question, I would, um, also very, very critical, um, as a multi-ethnic society, did Singapore witness societal fisheries around uh, ethnicity in terms of the COVID response and the outreach? Were narratives customized? Did uh, circuit breaker measures offer disaggregated analysis of COVID impact around the ethnic lines? So, and I stop here. So, um, depends who would like to start. Should we start by uh, uh, Sarah first? There is the gender part, there is the, the high debt burden. Yeah, um, so on, on gender again, it's something that Vietnam has a, a policy, a law on, on gender violence. And they have tried to put in place various um, programs for people to be able to, um, to seek help when they need it. But I think gender is still um, is a big problem in Vietnam. And I think that the pandemic has obviously exacerbated some of the issues for women in vulnerable situations. And, and that the, the NGO community has, has really struggled to, to support them. I think the, um, Vietnam has a high level of mobile phone use. And I think that has helped because people have an ability to reach out when they're stuck at home and they're in a situation that's dangerous. Um, the, but I think it's, it is a neglected issue in Vietnam, and I think that is definitely something that more and work needs to be done, and, and hopefully we can learn from other countries on that. Um, so the, the issue of the fiscal space for responding to the, the, the pandemic, I think that um, one of the things Vietnam's finance sector has done is try to not earmark spending too much. So they're trying to keep a certain flexibility so the central level can reallocate funds. So even though they've tried to push decentralization of the state budget, they do retain a certain amount of control at the central level to be able to respond. And preventive medicine is somewhat neglected within the health sector, but when the pandemic came about, it brought more priority to that sector and the, the funds fl flowed um, into prevention um, at that time. So I think that they were able to argue very easily to, to get the resources they needed. Um, but of course, the taxes are down, the revenues for the state have declined as a result of the pandemic. So 
I think they're still struggling how to recover on the financial side. Um, and I think that's, you were talking about multi-ethnic society, but I think that's more of the question for Singapore. Singapore. Yes, yeah. exactly. Uh, yeah. Very good. So Dr. Ruben, Dr. Patrick, who I would like to start um, if uh, in particular on the uh, multi-ethnic society responses. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in there. Our, first off, our data, we will be able to disaggregate that on the basis of ethnicity and, and, and that sort of issue. Uh, so we haven't had, we haven't really gone too deeply into that yet. Uh, but what I will say is that uh, Singapore has always been very intensely sensitive to issues of ethnic conflict. And it's kind of been a long standing source of national pride that they haven't dealt with the types of ethnic conflicts that we've seen in other Southeast Asian countries. And so there's often extra attention spent to minimize these sort of tensions, but also to make sure that as long as you're, if you're a citizen or a PR, that you don't fall through these gaps. So there is a lot of attention put in, in terms of different types of, different types of communities here to, to make sure that no one's really left behind in that sense. So I think there's a heightened sensitivity to make sure that none of the different ethnicities are allowed to become vulnerable or are disadvantaged in these cases. So that is a, a fairly top-down systemic long-standing thing. Uh, the second comment I wanted to make was about the finances. And I think it's really important to keep in mind when we're talking about Singapore is that yes, Singapore is a very wealthy country today. 30 years ago, it was a poor country. And you know, part of the ethos of Singapore as a country is the idea that wealth is resilience. You, every Singaporean has grown up on this notion of we have no natural resources, we don't produce food. Our only resources are our people is the standard sort of line here. The old Lee Kuan Yew model of third to first world is predicated upon that. And so the reserves they have today are not an accident. They didn't inherit them. They've made that a singular national priority going back four or five decades. Because when they started out, they were very poor. They weren't able to produce stuff. And so the only reasonable buffer they had against potentially aggressive neighbors or not being able to get food or this or that was to have financial reserves so they could buy those resources or capacities. So we're talking decades of significant investment in education, uh, lots of strategic building up of different industries. For example, now the biotech is a big thing here as well and incredibly conscientious saving both at the household level and the government level. So it's not really an accident or Singapore is lucky that they're wealthy. It's that for 40 or 50 years, They've built resilience singularly pretty much by building up that wealth as an asset. And this is the first time we've actually really seen them utilize that in terms of dipping into the reserves at this level. But it is a very powerful statement about long-term thinking, about prioritizing these things. And it comes out of fear. It comes out of deprivation. It comes out of Lee Kuan Yew's early ideas that we could be wiped off the map very easily because we're a tiny, small, poor country. So building up fiscal reserves, building up a strong military, building up strong education, healthcare, all of this is part of a long-term vision of resilience that comes out of a mindset of we are small, weak, and vulnerable. And so it's actually interesting to see that play out now, but I think it's important to remember that it's not just luck. We're not a, we didn't just sort of, we're not a Gulf state that just drilled for oil. It has been the result of decades of very conscientious policymaking and also restraint. There's been increasing conversations here among the population over the last decade about the reserves. Oh, you have all this money. Why don't you spend more of it? And the government has always been very tight fisted. Now they're saying, okay, you've always asked why we didn't spend it because we we're saving it for this moment. And so I think that's kind of an interesting sort of way to look at the Singapore experience. Thank you. Now, may, may I just add a, please, Anna, please. May I just add a quick footnote? You know, yes, I, I was listening to the Singapore prime minister um, um, just a couple of days ago, uh, a speech he made, and Singapore is having a massive, massive fiscal response in terms of supporting households and businesses, etc. And it is going to do that without borrowing a cent. It is going to have its whole program financed out of reserves. I think that really reinforces what Dr. Daly was saying, and that reinforces the direction we need to go in terms of building buffers and building resilience into our economy. Thank you. Okay. I, I, you know, on, on debt, sorry, quickly on, on debt and mm -hmm. things, uh, our debt and, and, and deficit dynamics as such, that it's you know, difficult for us to raise money abroad. But right now I must say, um, my former colleagues in the central bank are doing a great job in filling in, the lack of, filling in for the lack of, of, of fiscal space. 
Uh, they're financing the, the, uh, the fiscal deficit. Um, they are also providing money for the financial system. Uh, yeah. So the central bank has really stepped up. It seems to be the, you know, the main game in town right now. And I think it's right. give credit for that. No, excellent response. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Ruben, would you like to come in to any yeah, of the sure. responses to the questions? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, so uh, just some quick thoughts. I think the first point, the first learning point is really uh, about uh, that, you know, best practices may not be best for you. So we have learnings from all this, uh, from all different countries, but I think you really need to customize those things for your culture and context. I think that's extremely critical. So in Singapore itself, uh, we have done some customization for different uh, religious and ethnic groups. As you know, a very important uh, segment of our population, 20% are Muslims. So uh, I've seen very interesting videos uh, uh, done uh, with the Muslim community to show them the different touch points, uh, to different contact points when they go for Friday prayers about how the virus could spread in different contexts. So those, those videos are, are, are powerful because it uh, takes a person through the journey of how they'll typically do it, uh, uh, daily activities, especially through Friday press, where are the different potential spreading contact points and how you should mitigate it. So I thought that was very, one very good example. The other one is a majority of our older Chinese population do not speak Mandarin or English. They are still pretty much speaking dialects like Teochew, Hokkien, Cantonese and so on. And throughout the pandemic communications, we have gotten thought leaders or stars in this particular, in, in different area celebrities to, to explain to people uh, about how to take care of hygiene and things like that in different Chinese dialects. So I think that's another example of how we should really customize our communications because if everything is in English or Chinese, people cannot understand, they cannot identify with it. It's very hard uh, to practice it. The other point I wanted to make was with regard to technology. Uh, I think this... Uh, you know, COVID-19 uh, really presented a gold mine for what we call DevOps, uh, development operations, you know, closing the gap between development operations. In the past, we used to have so many proof of concepts, but we have no way to test it. Now it's, a, it's an amazing time to test all this technology and to, to really stress test it to see what is applicable and how do we further customize it to different age groups, such as older population and so on. So I think uh, it, it's, uh, it's a good opportunity to close the DevOps process to come up with tech that works. Uh, even though we are running out of time or we ran out of time, but there is one extra question that I would like to pose uh, uh, to uh, the uh, presenters, please. Uh, now, what steps are now being taken in Singapore to better serve the migrant workers and reduce risks throughout the community as a whole since uh, uh, the second wave? I think it's very relevant as well to Sri Lanka, so we'd like to see uh, to hear as much lessons as possible. Yeah, I'll start with that and uh, Ruben could jump in. Uh, I think there's two things to think about with the migrant workers. First, a big percentage of the migrant workers do live in dorms, but lots of them actually don't. So we have hundreds of thousands of domestic workers who, who actually are embedded in households. So the migrant worker scene is very fragmented. People have very different lived experiences. I think the, 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 the most difficult experience are amongst the men who are living in these dormitories, which are isolated. Uh, the government has actually dedicated tremendous resources, uh, medical, they've had the military involved, to, isolate people, to give massive testing, provide them really top class health care. And also they've done things like renting kind of not used cruise ships that are off the shore to actually turn into dormitories for people under isolation or are healthy. So they've actually gone to considerable lengths to try to deal with that issue. And part of it is a humanitarian thing and part of it is just a necessity thing. They don't want the, the, the infected to get into the wider population and they also need a lot of these people to continue working. Right? So there is a practical element as well but there is also a big concern that's not about Singapore per se. It's if we see a downturn in the industry over the next six to 12 months, there's a lot of concern in the migrant worker community, especially men who are involved in construction and things like that, that they may lose their jobs. And this won't be a matter of Singapore policy. It'll simply be they will no longer be necessary if there's less demand. So if there is a big economic downturn in some sectors, you could see a lot of migrant workers having to go home early or not getting their contracts renewed. And so I think you're going to start seeing a lot of stress in that world that I don't think the Singapore government would really see as its sort of domain. They leave this to more the, the private sector to work out. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I mean, for, yes, yes, Ruben, please come in. 
Yeah, so something, just, just one more point to add to uh, Patrick's uh, good analysis. Uh, the other point is that, you know, sometimes when we talk about uh, societal narratives in Singapore, these societal narratives does not include uh, migrant populations. Mm. So I think now we have to be a bit more, I think in Singapore, we realize we have to be very inclusive when we talk about societal narratives. It's not just about citizens, permanent residents, but it's also about migrant populations. So I think that's very critical. So I think when we talk about having a social barometer, it has to be as inclusive as possible, which then brings to uh, attention to very important contributions from civil society and international organizations. Sometimes it's not easy to get directly to these, uh, these populations, but there are civil society that have really been doing great work among them. That's where they become very critical as a bridge to this uh, maybe migrant population to understand their views so that they can be incorporated into national strategies, uh, national barometers and implementation. Thank you very much, Ruben. I think you've covered even a question that I uh, uh, couldn't get forward, uh, which is the experience. How can this experience foster greater space for uh, civil society to contribute to the effective crisis response? And I think you've, uh, you've covered it well. I mean, the issue, of course, in, uh, in uh, Sri Lanka is not uh, foreign migrants, but it's really the returnees. And this is uh, where I think uh, we, we need uh, specific policies and guidance on also how uh, to uh, to reintegrate them into society, uh, into the uh, uh, employment uh, um, uh, environment, etc., and recalibrate their uh, their skills as well in order to integrate well. I don't know if um, if um, uh, our colleague from uh, our friend from uh, uh, CEO of Dilma can uh, come in on that. Sorry, Hannah. So, I mean, where the workers uh, are, are, are concerned, uh, naturally, it's a it, it's it's a challenge that uh, is is difficult, particularly in a Sri Lankan context. Now, where um, our uh, response was concerned, initially there was an emphasis on looking at the least served in our population. I mean, that uh, uh, was a combination of uh, um, state aid and, uh, uh, unfortunately, the challenges were in getting the aid to the people insufficient time. And I think in this sense, one of the post-COVID, the framework for, for uh, managing future such situations could include how we collaborate better amongst the state and the private sector. And this is something that uh, we have discussed before, but establishing that would help us to replicate some of the examples that we've heard and seen internationally of how technology can respond in providing solutions. Excellent. Thank you very much. Okay, I think we've kept you long enough. This has been really, I think, an excellent, an excellent, really, discourse and, and uh, so much to learn from. Uh, so thanks to the panelists and to the, the discussions and to also those who contributed with the questions. I mean, just again, I mean, just some highlights uh, of uh, what we have uh, listened to, the, the Vietnam learning from the SARS epidemic, uh, the investment from the government and from WHO in the contact tracing, the importance of biotechnology, I think mentioned a couple of times also from our discussions, and, um, uh, and, uh, um, and also uh, the importance of uh, communications campaign that are, that are consistent uh, and, uh, and regular as well. We've also, I think from Dr. Uh, Anil, we the, noted the move from passive surveillance to active surveillance in Sri Lanka and how expansion of these approaches uh, could mirror Vietnam. We're from, uh, from Ruben, we also, um, I think, picked the fast-moving social narratives and the intention of what governments want to communicate is not always what is perceived. So important to understand what the narrative in each country uh, is. From Patrick, I think Singapore, uh, excellent uh, sobering lessons learned of how after the initial strong response, so the second wave, but also emphasizing the importance of leaving no one behind and lots of other economic lessons uh, um, uh, that is societal and it took generation to, uh, to learn, but I think this is something a lot that we can learn from a lot. Um, we also, from all our discussions, who noted many salient points, Sri Lanka too can uh, adopt measures such as uh, the social barometers, building physical buffers, as I said, rather than living on the edge, 
and the importance of the role also uh, of the partnership between the state, uh, the civil society, and, uh, and, the, uh, and the private sector. I think it's really this partnership that makes uh, the victory over, uh, over this uh, uh, disease. Um, I want to say, I think we've really learned a lot uh, today from each other, and uh, I invite you, <clears throat> I invite our very uh, distinguished audience to stay with us throughout uh, this series. We will be carrying uh, this series over uh, um, a few sessions, and uh, given that many questions uh, to the Sri Lankan discussion we could not address today due to the time constraint, we will look to reconvene as many of them to address elements of the Sri Lankan response. So I hope you will have uh, uh, the patience to, uh, to re-engage with us again, because there are lots of questions that I think it, it is wonderful to, to hear and to discuss and to learn lessons learned. So to each and every one of you, thank you again for staying. If, uh, half an hour, no, more, 35 minutes more than the original plan. Uh, and, and thanks for uh, the incredible and extremely excellent lessons learned. Um, and thanks for those who woke up very early in order to join us as well. So all the best to all, to uh, thank you and uh, the best of luck. And I really hope uh, uh, we'll see you again in the next series. Thank you.